President Zuma, former President Mo Kante, Rabbi Goldstein, Bernard Henri Levy, members of the Jewish community throughout Southern Africa, ladies and gentlemen, I am very proud to be here in Johannesburg to be with you, not just because of your dynamic communities, but because I believe South Africa represents a beacon of hope in a very troubled world. Let me explain. Just look at the headlines and you see a very troubled world. I don't, I don't have to remind you of the ongoing human disaster in the Middle East. You know, you all know what is happening here now. The terror of radical Islam has spread everywhere. Just a week ago we watched the tragic terror attacks up in Paris. On Friday, it was Mali. And in Israel, those terror attacks never stop. But now, no one feels safe anywhere, so the world looks for guidance. We look to conflicts that were peacefully resolved. Sadly, there are few. But South Africa stands out as the one shining example. President Zuma, members of the Jewish community, South Africans. You rise above all others as a beacon of hope, of reconciliation. Yes, you have the brilliant direction of Nelson Mandela and the strong continued leadership from President Zuma. But in the end, it was all South Africans who decided enough, enough hatred, enough division, enough violence. South Africans wanted better lives for their children and their grandchildren. So the difficult process of compromise and reconciliation was achieved. Today, the world needs to learn your important lesson. I hope South Africa will offer the guidance to all of us that we desperately need. This meeting in Johannesburg could not come at a more important time because the Jewish people and the African people have a long and shared history. Israel's fourth prime minister, Golda Meir, once said there, that there is not one people on earth who have suffered more over the centuries than the Jews, with the possible exception of the African people. I think this is true. Both people, Jews and Africans, have suffered from terrible discrimination, and both people fought that discrimination together. It is written that although Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King never met they fought for the same cause on two different continents. Mandela lived to see his dream. King did not. I am old enough to remember Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement in the United States. I know there were rabbis who marched arm in arm with Martin Luther King. I know that young Jewish people demonstrated the 1960s to end segregation in the American South. And sadly, I know that young Jews and young blacks died together in that struggle to free a people. It was the same here in South, Af South Africa. Just as Jews helped in the U.S., South African Jews helped Nelson Mandela Nelson Mandela's lawyer in the Rivonia trial were Jewish. The other defendants on trial with him were Jewish. Names like Helen Sussman and Joe Slovo. And the first man to hire Man uh, Nelson Mandela was Lazar Sidelsky. These were all Jewish people who stood by Nelson Mandela and the struggle for freedom. At the same time, 
We must be honest. Not all Jews helped when they could have. This is something the Jewish community admits. But there were many, many, many more South African Jews that helped in this cause. This because both people, Jews and blacks, know the sting of discrimination. They also know this tragedy. Jews and blacks know that where discrimination can lead. That is why the World Jewish Congress was created. It was in the summer of 1936, a group of concerned Jewish leaders gathered in Switzerland to draw the world's attention to the growing threat coming out of Nazi Germany. But the world did not listen. The world was silent. It was indifferent. It looked the other way. Two weeks ago, we passed the 77th anniversary of Kristallnacht. On that night, November 9th, 1938, Hitler launched anti-Jewish riots throughout Germany and Austria. In English, Kristallnacht means Night of Crystal. Why would such a terrible night have such a poetic name? Because there was much broken glass in the streets from the windows of the Jewish shops and homes that were ransacked that looked like crystals sparkling in the moonlight. Jews were beaten in the streets. Businesses were destroyed. And over a thousand synagogues were burned to the ground. But the worst part was once again the world's reaction. Again we saw indifference. We saw silence. The world looked the other way. And Hitler understood he could do whatever he wanted with the Jews. The world would not say anything. If you want to know when the Holocaust began, it began on November 9th, 1938. It began on Kristallnacht. Yes, Jews know where silence will lead. We learned that lesson the hard way. And we will never, never be silent again. The World Jewish Congress has been fighting silence and indifference since it began in 1936. We are the diplomatic arm of the Jewish people throughout the world. We represent Jewish people in over 100 countries on every continent. Many of these communities are not large. I know that some of you come from small communities in Botswana, in Kenya, Mauritius, Mozambique, Namibia, Swaziland, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. But you should know that we watch over every Jewish community, no matter the size. We meet with the leaders of every country, and when Jews face problems, we are the first to step in and help. But this is a two-way street. We also need you to come to us whenever there is anything we can do to help you. There is no other Jewish organization that has this role. We've also been a strong advocate for the rights of Jews to live peacefully and safely in Israel. We condemn terrorist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah, which have absolutely no intention of living alongside a Jewish state. How do we know this? How do we know this? Because they say it all the time. They continue to call for the destruction of Israel. Likewise, we condemn Iran for promising to wipe Israel from the pages of history. We learned that when murderous dictators say they want to kill you, they mean what they say. But at the same time, we will not give up on peace. We still believe the only possible way 
to achieve a real peace between Israel and the Palestinian people is a viable two-state solution. Two states for two people, the Jewish state of Israel and a viable Palestinian state for Palestinians, living side by side in peace and security. I was on the White House, White House lawn when Itzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat signed the peace treaty. And I remember the joy and the elation that everyone felt that day. That's, this is what drives me. But I'm not naive. I'm aware of the difficulties. I believe South Africa can engage all parties and explain why violence must be rejected. <laughs> South Africa can show that compromise in the interest of peace with respect for the other side. And it can lead for a better future for all. And South Africa can show the importance of democratic values and the acceptance of other cultures. Israel knows this firsthand because Israel is the only democratic nation in the Middle East. And Israel is still the only country in the Middle East that believes in pluralism. Over one million Palestinian Arabs live in Israel. And Israel is the only country in the Middle East where the Christian population is growing, not shrinking. And it's only Israel where the holy sites of all religions are protected and not destroyed. <laughs> only since Jerusalem was united in 1967 could all three religions, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, pray at their holy sites. Before that, these sites were closed to all Jews. It was Israel that opened them up. When religions are threatened throughout the Middle East, it is not Israel that threatens them. The World Jewish Congress has worked to make the world aware of the slaughter of Christians in Syria and Iraq and parts of North Africa. I personally got involved because I was appalled at the world's silence and its indifference as hundreds of thousands of Christians are forced, have been murdered and forced to flee their homes. In Bethlehem, the Christian population was once over 80 percent and today it is less than 15 percent. As I've said, Jews know all too well what can happen in the world of silence. We learned that lesson the hard way. That is why we, took up the, we have taken up the cause of our Christian brothers and sisters. I must also add that although South Africa's Jewish community may not be the largest in the world, its contributions to the greater world and to South Africa have been disproportionate in business, in science, in medicine, everything that makes lives better. Jews helped build South Africa. The Jewish community, through the Jewish Board of Deputies, has also made a huge disproportionate contribution to the global Jewish world. Through the very able leadership of Mary Clark and the late Mervyn Smith and the African Jewish Congress has not just helped the Jewish communities in, so in southern Africa, it has helped make life better for all people. In the end, this is what we Jews do. This is always our strong focus on life, on helping all people live better lives. Think about it for a second. Israel is a country of eight million people but when the world needs agricultural innovation, it looks to Israel. When the world needs water, it looks to Israel. When the world needs technology, it looks to Israel. And it looks for Israel for the medical breakthroughs that are saving lives everywhere.
If you allow me for a moment, I want to tell you a story. I was recently asked at a press conference in Rome after we met with the Pope about the boycott against Israel doctors. And it was a reporter from England who asked me the question. And I told the reporter, if those seeking the boycott of doctors have a child with a heart problem or cancer, would they boycott the medical breakthroughs coming out of Israel to save their child? He was speechless. Israel shares this with everyone. Israel is open to everyone. Israel is not the apartheid state. Today in the UN, the African countries play a very important role. African countries are part of the non-allied group of nations. Unfortunately, they often vote as a group with the Arab states. But when we think about it, African countries really have more in common with Israel. Think about the parallels between the Refuseniks, those Soviet Jews willing to stand up to the Soviet Union, and Nelson Mandela. The similarities are huge. Natan Sharansky spent a decade in the terrible Siberian gulag simply because he was a Jew. And like the great Nelson Mandela, it was Sharansky who helped bring the end to the Soviet dictatorship. I believe it makes more sense for African countries to be aligned with Israel. We understand what it's like to be discriminated against. We understand what it's like to be the targets of hate. We are not your enemies. Give us a chance. Do not turn away from us. Finally, I say to you, President Zuma, we have so much to learn from each other. We just don't have a shared past. We have a promising future. You have pushed through oppression and come to a new day of peace and reconciliation. The entire world looks to South Africa for this lesson. Jews have also pushed through prejudice and world indifference. The Jewish people continue to fight oppression. We also look to the future like you and we see a better day, not just for our children, but all children, Arab children, Christian children, black children, white children, all children everywhere. But let us not just hope for the better day. Let us work for it, and let us work for get, together. Do not turn away from us. Give us a chance. We bring great strengths to this cause. Do not turn away from us. Together, Africans and Jews, we can accomplish so much. Work with us, and together we will see that better day.